I'm not sure. 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 That's why, like, when you came in, it's like, and I didn't, I didn't, yeah, no, I just happened to be out. I was like, I'll just come. I did it in longer ways. I was like, I probably want to get out of Hi, team. Hi. Hi. <laughs> we'll, we'll come say hi in just a second. <laughs> We're getting everything all set up. <laughs> Take your time. There's no yeah. hurry. I hope you got your way. Oh, it's more. Is it? Is it? Yeah, I went to. I went to download. And then... No, it's a PDF. That's why. Which is totally fine. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah. We'll be able to see her in just a second. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, what we can do is we can actually go through and look around and do the accident. I just don't quite know how. But if she's um, because they would have to like do a little scroll. Yeah. Or just I know there's like a present. There's like a present mode on this. So when it comes to this person. How am I going to get them to show up up there? Let's try it. Um, without be everything being in the way. And there she is, up here. She does exist. She can be here. She can be here. Hey, Ida. Hi. Hey, hi. You have to give it to Ashley so she can say hello too. And then we're just going to pass it down and say hello to all of Hey, hi, Ida. How are you? Are you drinking coffee? <laughs> I've had a strong cup. It's getting late, so but all yes. good. It's We're been so a long day waiting. <laughs> <laughs> We're so glad you're here. And I'm nervous. Hello, I think Ida. Thank you day. for staying up so late to join uh, us. Uh, hey, we Alex. miss you. We're here. We oh, missed you I last missed night you. at dinner. I missed you too. Oh. How are you, Ida? Hey, Yogesh. You having a good conference? Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, so good. People over there. Yeah, I've I've been able to join in with pretty much everything, so it's been great. Okay, great. Yeah, no, it's been really good. It's worked really well, except for Kathy. I got booted <laughs> out of Kathy's um, keynote, but other than that, it was really good. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we start in five minutes, I believe. Yeah. 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 Arrows. Arrows. Got it. Did you get that Yogesh arrows on the side as well? No, it's no, no, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very good. Because that very seems very to work well. Yeah. 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 So doing that with Yogesh, and then whenever we start sharing, uh, yeah, we can. Okay, so I'll be sharing because after me, Ida is. So okay. that we'll be able to see her too. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this takes you to the next slide. Oh, sorry, no, we have oh. it clicked off. So there we go. And then, okay. Oh, the next button. You saw the down button. It's the next button. Yeah. This one. Yeah, one of those okay. oh. <laughs> this one. This one will go. Yeah. This one, will take, it wasn't this, before. this one will take you back to it. This one. Yeah, will take no, you well, I know that that's what it usually does, but it really wasn't. It really, yeah, we, it really <laughs> wasn't. Uh, 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 <laughs> Believe me, I know when slides don't work. You have suffered it badly. I, I give no ground on that to anybody. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah of this yeah. It's true. She's perky. Yeah. She said, coffee. Yeah, she is. She is. <laughs> she is at her best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so she yeah. has to keep uh, yes. this so one. Yes. So I wonder if this is what is taking you to the Zoom. Okay, okay. that's online. great. Well, until you're ready to start, I would leave it here so we can see. Okay, okay. and then I just tick the this one or that one. Oh, yeah. it'll be that one. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Wait, that's, well, fine. That that's fine. That's fine. And then how do they won't be able to see it? 
You gotta go through Zoom. Yeah, I know. We're gonna we're gonna share one of the different ones. Yeah, I think that's what she's asking. That is what I'm asking. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna go try ahead again. Share? Yeah, sure. Okay. And that way everyone online can see. Yeah, yeah. and then okay, that's good. I think, I think that's better to have Perfect. it set up. Yeah. Well, uh, is that, what was okay. your question? Yeah. This okay. is someone's water. Okay. Of course. I'm actually gonna clean recording is going, so it's whenever it's all right. Okay, and I'm gonna use those and yeah, you can go. use those. Yeah. I think that well, I don't trust yeah, that. I don't Sorry, I really don't. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and then I can do it. Yeah, it's up and down, it's working. So I, I'm going to go it works. I know. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> yeah, but if it doesn't work, people will think it's me, you know, so <laughs> it's entirely possible. Well, it's true. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could put you on the same position I was in. I like that idea. It's a great idea. I should go for that. And <laughs> am I taking control or will you just flick through for me? I'm Super. Yeah, you can see us, right, Edith? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, you good. You're slightly can, can you see the slides? I can see them on my screen here, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Yogesh will advance the slides for Lovely. you. Lovely. It's pretty okay. simple. There's just six slides, one per feature, so it's pretty easy. Okay, okay. <laughs> and all you'll have to say is just, you know, yeah. Yeah. slide yeah, yeah, Yogesh. Yeah. It'll be fun to boss him around. You can be a bossy pants. <laughs> Move on. Move on. <laughs> Why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Something about my something about me and technology. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> That's too much. We're all just there. <laughs> really excited. I'm Exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it broke, I can put them all in. Or, or, or a long one with no big <laughs> you know, we're not going to have fun. Yeah. I think we It's for you. There's something about my relationship with technology that has been challenged in the conference. Fortunately, I'm the chair and I'm not talking very long. <clears throat> and it is my pleasure to welcome you. I'm Kathy Yancey. Um, and if I'm using this one, I don't have to use that one. Is that right? Or I have to use them both? 
we'll use them both. So now I'm gonna welcome people online as well. I'm still Kathy Yancey, I was before, I am now, and I, I may be, we'll see how this goes. Um, I do wanna thank you for spending your time with us this afternoon, the last session and the next to last day when it's really beautiful out, you're spending your time with us. And to be sure that you do, we're going to lock the door. No, I'm kidding, we're not. But we do hope you'll stay with us. This is a fun presentation. This is a fun group. And as you can see, I just wanna have fun. Before I introduce the session, I do wanna make a land acknowledgement. I want to uh, acknowledge the Cherokee who were on this land before the enslaved people who helped build Clemson. And at FSU, I want to acknowledge the Appalachee, the Muskegee, the Miccosukee, and the Seminoles, uh, who also were removed. Uh, and then uh, Tallahassee was also built by uh, enslaved people. Our session today, as you can see from the screen, uh, is tracing students' life-wide writing, implications for WAC programs, and um, it is sponsored by uh, the Elon Institute uh, uh, called uh, Writing Beyond the University. And we have some members of those. I'm waving at them, and we're glad to have them with us. Uh, we started this project in 2019. And it's worth noting uh, that most of it uh, was done um, online because of COVID. And we're especially glad to be presenting uh, today to you because it's the first time that all but one of us have been back together. And our, we're missing our colleague, Edia uh, Sullivan, but she is joining us online and, and she's with us and she's waving at you now. Our study, as you can see from the slide, emerged from the Elon University Writing Beyond the University Seminar, as I indicated. It focused on three questions. What, if anything, do upper division undergraduate students year three and above through graduation, which is the way we operationalized uh, upper division, learn about writing in their writing beyond the classroom experiences? Second, what kind of recursivity, if any, do they perceive among their curricular writing experiences and those beyond the university? And I'll operationalize those in a moment. And what are the implications for universities globally for the ways that they can foster and support students in making connections across spheres? Um, and our research did focus on what we called spheres of writing. And spheres of writing uh, we defined as being contexts where students write while they're in college, typically concurrently. Uh, as you're going to find, there were six spheres that we looked at, including classroom spheres, self-sponsored, internship, civic, and so on. We have three publications that have emerged so far from this project using the same data set, and we'll describe that data set for you momentarily. Uh, the first one, uh, as you can see, is titled, There's a Lot of Overlap, Tracing Writing Development Across Spheres of Writing, which um, appears in the Writing Beyond the University edited collection coming out of Elon. And in that particular project, we looked at the spheres that stood, the question we asked was, do they write in multiple contexts? And the short answer was yes then what that particular chapter does is articulate what those spheres are and the relationships that students saw among them. And the, the most interesting thing perhaps is that students do a lot of writing and they do seem relationship across those spheres. The second piece came out last summer in Composition Forum, which is a special issue dedicated on discourse-based um, uh, interviews. And our particular contribution there was on interviews uh, that are informed by students' maps. Because in addition to interviewing them, we also asked them to map their spheres to identify what they wrote inside those spheres, some of the processes they used, and the relationships across them. And then the most recent publication, which is coming out any minute, uh, is The Writing Lives of Students, Lifewide Writing, which is coming out in the WAC Journal. And basically what you're getting here is a preview of that. Um, uh, sorry, I think. Here we go. So the outline of the presentation today, I'm going to be departing the scene happily enough just to go to the table. Uh, and Ashley will give us more information about WAC and lifelike writing. Alexis uh, will share with us the survey results. We have hundreds of results from students in, from three continents. Yogesh will remind us about the research methods that we used in this particular project. And then Ida will talk about students' writing lives in terms of what they told us in the interviews. And although it's not here, um, Ashley is gonna close up by talking about implications for WAC programs. So without further ado, let me welcome Ashley to the podium. Thank you, thanks for being here. Um, 
So um, as Kathy was saying, we're going to focus here on uh, a set of findings related to our article that's coming out on life-wide writing across the curriculum. Okay, two mics, okay. Um, and so um, what we argue in this piece uh, is that... Uh, what we know from WAC scholarship is that WAC encourages diverse styles and genres of, for, of writing for different disciplines, purposes, and audiences. We know this, I've cited Russell here, but there's lots of other folks we could cite too. Um, but what we noticed uh, uh, is that the locus of WAC is often within academic courses and departments and in service of disciplinary learning, but, which are both worthy goals. And so what our team is interested in doing is keeping those goals, not getting rid of those. But uh, at the same time, we invite folks to re-envision WAC through the lens of students' multiple writing lives, uh, those both within and beyond the university. And this is an approach we're calling life-wide writing across the curriculum. Oh, I'm used to hitting it. Is it down or up? Yeah. Oh, thank you. So um, uh, many of you may have been at the presentation this morning. Um, uh, about writing beyond the university. We were part of that group, our team. And so there's great research there and elsewhere coming out about writing beyond the university. Um, th much of this is defining beyond as outside of the classroom uh, or college through things like internships, uh, self-sponsored writing, co-curricular contexts, alumni writing, lifespan writing, and writing beyond the university. So um, many of these prior studies are ones that are continuing to happen are situated in, in kind of a temporal beyond. So looking at what happens to students and the kind of writing they do once they've graduated. Um, and so our team was really interested in, in thinking about this in a life-wide or a spatial lens rather than a temporal lens. Um, so rather than lifelong, we're, we're envisioning this as life-wide. And what that means really is capturing the width and breadth of students writing lives while still in college and operationalizing those as spheres, as Kathy was saying. So we sought to better understand in students' own words and visual representations, their spheres of writing, the kinds of writing they do in those spheres, and the recursivities that they perceive across those spheres. So while they're currently students, what other kinds of writing are they doing? Where are they doing it? Um, that's what we asked them about. Yeah, too many hands. So to tell you a little bit about our data collection context, um, so there's considerable research on first year composition, but we know less about what happens to college writers after first year composition. So um, our team collected data from students in years three or later of college. Um, and so we asked them about the context where they write. We operationalized those as spheres of writing and we identified seven of them. And they are self-motivated, co-curricular, internship, workplace, civic community, academic, and other, which we left open-ended and allowed students to kind of comment and define for themselves. We also asked students about their understandings of the relationships between and across these spheres of writing. We call these relationships recursivities. In fact, we were team, our team recursivities in the CEL. So we have lots of other nicknames I will not share. <laughs> um, so the design of the study involved uh, six research sites, um, Allegheny College, Florida State University, Sohar University in Oman, Duquesne University in Pennsylvania, Georgia State University, and the University of Limerick in Ireland. Um, and what we did is uh, we started with online surveys. Uh, those were collected in fall 2019 and spring 2020. Across the six uh, institutions, we collected 239 um, survey responses. And then we did follow-up interviews with students at each of the six institutions. Um, and th those happened spring, summer, and fall of 2020. We had originally planned to do those in person. We had colored markers and they were gonna map, it was gonna be great. And then uh, March, 2020 hit and you know what happened next. So um, we moved those to an online context. We write a little bit about this in our piece on the mapping. Um, it was a challenge, but it actually ended up working out great. Um, so we followed up with two to five students per institution for a total of 24 combined interviews. 
Um, and part of the interview involved pre and post mapping. We're not gonna talk a lot about the mapping today uh, in the data set, but if you're interested, check out that composition forum article. Um, and so we started at the beginning of the interview by asking students to map their spheres. We gave them that list of six, well, seven, if you include other spheres of writing, gave them some time with their camera off and a muted mic to just map that out um, and then come back on and explain that. And then we had a series of questions that we asked them about the spheres in which they write. Um, the texts, they shared with us texts um, from the spheres that they identified writing in and we asked them questions about those texts. And then at the end of the interview, we came back and asked them, do you have any changes that you would make to your map? And some of them, many of them did uh, make changes and some of them did not. Um, but uh, so that was a part of the interview as well. And they were conducted online during COVID. And so this brings us to uh, more focus uh, on the concept of life-wide writing uh, that we're gonna talk about today. And so the inquiries, we collected this data set, we've written about it in different ways, uh, different pieces of the data we focused on. But this, um, our inquiry into life-wide writing, you know, at the heart of it is the question, how can our understandings of the diversity and complexity in students writing lives within and beyond the classroom inform our approach to writing-based initiatives and writing across the curriculum in higher education? So um, what we're gonna do today, I'm gonna turn over the mic to Alexis in just a minute, and she's gonna focus on um, our early analysis of survey data, uh, which showed a diversity of genres across students' spheres of writing. And then uh, Yogesh is gonna talk to you about uh, kind of how we took a deeper dive with the interview data that resulted in additional analysis. And he's gonna talk you through our four-step coding process that we use specifically with the interviews to arrive at the data that, um, and the analysis that Ida is gonna talk about, which is the six features of students' writing lives that kind of came out of our analysis of that. And then I'll come back on to um, talk about some implications uh, we see for WAC programs. Hand it over to you. So not only did we have different nicknames, we also had a song. Happiness <laughs> is Ida and Kathy. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I won't I won't continue. Um, but uh, Right, people are talking about singing on the podium. <laughs> and as Kathy said, we're here to have some fun as well. So um, as Ashley indicated, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our survey findings. Um, and when we asked them about the spheres in which they wrote, um, over 86% reported writing in four or more spheres. So such life-wide writing indicates that students do have rich writing lives. Um, and the two most common spheres in which they wrote were course-based, which again, um, as we said, we were looking at students who were still in college um, and self-motivated. So what I'm gonna do um, is talk about that I, in the surveys that we collected, we did have some open-ended questions um, and we asked them, if you write in this sphere, right, what kinds of writing do you do in that sphere? And we realized that one of the most prominent ways that students understand their relationships or recursivities is through this lens of genre. So they, they use genre as a rhetorical tool for talking about their writing within and beyond the university. Um, and so I'm gonna talk through our spheres starting with the sphere in which um, students, the spheres in which students have the least um, uh, number of reported writing. And that was um, the civic sphere and then the co-curricular spheres. So we heard um, earlier today from our um, colleagues and friends at Elon um, about, you know, the co-curricular space is a space where they're, where, where they're learning, right? That, that um, you know, the, college, uh, and when they're in college, um, they may not recognize it, but when they're alumni, they're like, oh, you know, my campus job is a place, or, you know, the club I was in was a place where I was doing a lot of this work, the number of emails that I write, 
Um, you know, in fact, one of our participants talked about, you know, when I write for this particular club, I have to use a lot of emojis and a lot of, you know, but when I write for this other, you know, um, when I'm writing for my campus job, I have to be more professional on things. So um, we see that they're writing, you know, professional genres in these spheres. They're making posters, they're writing memos, taking meeting minutes. Um, and again, we really want to highlight the voices of the students. Um, and they were, they were less prevalent in the survey data, but they were there. So several commented um, with regard to the, the civic sphere that these were purpose-driven right, writing. Um, they were committed um, as civic-minded writers, for instance, to quote, work toward giving people justice. Um, and the, the um, S4 there is school four, this was our convention, um, or to quote, raise awareness for a cause. So they're really seeing, again, they're writing lives, they have purpose in writing in these two spheres is what we were seeing from the survey data. Next were the work-based internship spheres. Um, and again, probably not um, surprising some of the genres they're talking about here, emails, again, emails. People, right, yes, email is a genre that people don't like, but it's used a lot. Um, presentations, briefs, um, social media, blog posts, um, we see that coming back again in self-motivated uh, writing, but they're doing this professionally as well in, in work um, and in their internships. And here, what we um, saw in the surveys were students reporting personal value and enjoyment in writing because they were related to their career goals. So um, one student from school four said, quote, my internship sphere consists of work-related experiences, especially because it was heavily related to my career goals. I enjoyed everything about my internship. In the self-motivated sphere, which was this um, a highly, a lot of our um, survey respondents said they wrote in the self-motivated sphere. So this ranged from everything from creative writing, personal writing, um, digital, social media, text messages. We saw texting, right? Is what most people do. I can't use my thumbs, but um, others do. Um, but also things like goal setting, right? To-do lists. Um, what were they, what did they, you know, aspirational goal setting? Um, what did they want to achieve? Um, and really, um, this idea that they, they had the opportunity to energetically express themselves. So um, a student from school three um, said, quote, writing is a self-expressive way to release energy and spread wisdom. Um, a student from school four said, quote, writing is an expression, freedom, and an emptying of energy. So this idea um, of energetic expression we saw there. And then <laughs> the biggest um, sphere in which they wrote, uh, we see this significant departure. Um, so the rich diversity of genres, purposes, and audiences we saw in these other spheres of writing um, just were um, anemic in the course-based sphere. So primarily students said they were writing the essay, right? 78% of um, our respondents used the word essay or some version of essay. Um, in their comments for this sphere. Um, and so what we noted was that this suggests a limited sense of personal expression, purpose and agency. So we saw that purpose-driven, right? That energetic energy coming in these other spheres. We're not seeing that as much in the course-based sphere. And just this narrow view of audience, right? Beyond the quote, thesis-driven essay for a professor or quote, papers my teachers assigned to me. Um, and so again, um, hearkening back to our, our colleagues' um, presentation earlier today in their surveys, seeing that when they asked, you know, alumni, did, did you feel prepared? This idea that I wasn't prepared to write for an audience beyond the, beyond the professor based on what I learned in school-based writing, or that I don't, really, I don't really feel comfortable adapting to different readers' needs because I didn't have the opportunity to do that within my, um, course-based writing. So um, I'm going to end in this um, idea that we really can um, leverage the value of writing in multiple spheres, right? That when we ask students to tell us in their own words, right? Again, more, you know, 78% of them are writing in four or more of the spheres that we identified. They come back and convey this nuanced understanding of both the choices and constraints they have as writers depending on the rhetorical situations in which they're writing. 
Um, and so I'll end um, with a student's words, because again, we want to privilege those. I'm sorry, I'm probably rubbing the microphone. I'm sorry if that's bothering people online. <laughs> My, my sense of bodily space is not great. Um, so a student, one, a, a student from school one said this, quote, I have learned by writing in many spheres that writing is extremely versatile. As I've learned to navigate the nuances of writing across disciplines and writing for many different reasons, I've focused less on proving my prowess as a writer and focusing more on conveying a message. I've also learned that producing high quality writing whatever that looks like, right? So that looks different in different spheres, um, is advantageous almost anywhere. And with that, I will turn it over to Yogesh. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, Alexis, thank you, online audience, as well as the audience in person. Uh, thanks, team recursivities. Uh, this is the truly uh, intercontinental team. We, we boast of um, having done our research in three continents, Asia, Europe, and America. Uh, Ida is there from Europe. Okay. Uh, so I'm into uh, the research process, uh, into students writing lives, and we picked up the interviews in order to go ahead in uh, terms of uh, in detailing the research process. It's, we are calling it an iterative process for life-wide writing. And uh, as part of registration for this particular conference, we were supposed to attend a workshop and I attended one on RAD. Uh, this is obviously not what we are trying to replicate in terms of the process. So that's what if Michael is around, he might be listening to that. So what we did was we uh, coded the interview transcripts, both deductively and inductively uh, for detailed um, understanding of the interview questions. You can see the Composition Forum article that we have published uh, over Sullivan and et al. Uh, is, is mentioned there. In the discourse-based interviews, students more fully describe the writing activities constituting life-wide writing. So we dived into the interview findings to explore the six features of life-wide writing that we have come up with. How did we identify the features of life-wide writing? So essentially, the idea was that uh, testing the viability of writing lives as a descriptive concept, uh, that entailed a much more systematic and progressive review of the interview transcripts, which proceeded in uh, four steps. So essentially we engaged in four steps coding process. The first step of the four step coding process involved uh, each member of our team reading a small sample, one transcript from each institution. Uh, we uh, are reporting on uh, five institutions data over here to nominate possible defining features of writing lives with several caveats. So that was the first process, the first step. Uh, the caveats were, if no defining features were identified, the concept would not be viable. And because we had institutions across uh, three continents, we made one more caveat. Uh, we said that if such features occurred in a limited subset of interviews, for example, in US institutions only, then it would likewise be not viable. So those were initial uh, stages of our coding process. And after the initial review, uh, we came up with seven features. The second step involved uh, three team members reviewing the full set of interviews with a goal of identifying all possible instances of each of the seven features. And that's where the major work was involved in which we tried to negotiate with each other into how we are proceeding ahead. That's where we went into this step three, where all members of the research team now 
reviewed the set of identified instances for three purposes. Purpose number one was to agree with the categorization of each instance, optionally commenting on it. Number two, to disagree with the categorization as either incorrectly categorized or not a feature at all with optional comments. And or the third one was to indicate uncertainty and an explanation as to how or why. And finally, the four step coding process culminated into the team debriefing, attending especially to the number of instances needed for the feature to be definitional. A threshold for this decision was set. Each feature of rich writing lives needed to be represented by at least 50% of the interviews. And the interviews themselves needed to represent, as we said, uh, as we said, the caveats earlier, all institutions. And to contribute to the definition of writing lives, then each feature thus needed widespread frequent mention. After having gone through all this, uh, six of the seven features that we had initially identified uh, met this threshold. So those were our findings essentially. And that's where Ida would come in to let you know about the interview findings. Ida, are you there? Thank you, Yogesh. Please let me know if you have any issues hearing me. We, we, Excellent. We can hear you. We can hear Thank you, well. you. Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to join you from Ireland. As Alexis bursts into song, it makes me sad that I'm not there in person, but I am grateful to the organizers for providing a hybrid version. I'm delighted to share with you the six characteristics um, that were characterizing students' writing lives. Um, we define these as follows, writing regularly and sustained engagement, valuing writing, engaging in personal expression and having the opportunity to be heard, using writing for entry into and continuation of community membership, perceiving writing as providing rich connections, and being aware of accepting challenges inherent in writing. So the survey data told us a little bit about the richness of the students' writing lives. Calling on the interview data, in particular the discourse-based interviews and the visual mapping provided by the students allows us to delve into a little more detail about the students, which the characteristics of students writing across the spheres and across the genre. And I just want to take a couple of moments to look at each of these characteristics and to draw on a couple of extracts from the interviews to exemplify these characteristics. So in the first instance of writing regularly and sustained engagement, we see that the students talk about this in two ways. In the first instance of writing regularly and sustained engagement, students enacted a sustained commitment and engagement with writing. This was often in the self-motivated spheres. Um, it often involved daily writing in the forms of journaling, for example. Um, students spoke about it as often being informal and less pressured, um, and that it was part of a routine. This student here from school two, the second student, shares with us an example of them composing a short story. And the writer tells us, yes, I wrote it last summer just after having a cup of coffee in the morning. I felt inspired and I just wrote it in one sitting. OK, OK, that's interesting. OK, do you do much of that kind of writing? Yeah, all the time you do. OK, have you always done this much writing? Yeah, ever since I could write. OK, that's great. So you definitely identify as a writer. I do. In the second instance, students still in this first characteristic, students call on and they speak about that regularity, not just in one sphere, but in a multiplicity of spheres, addressing a multiplicity of tasks and across many purposes. Um, for example, students talk about their summer writing, they talk about the long emails they write for their jobs, they talk about the posters they make for their clubs. So 
writing regularly and sustained writing is not just in particular spheres, but across the spheres and students talk about it in quite sophisticated and complex ways. When we look at the characteristic of valuing writing, um, a majority of students talk to us about the value of writing for them. And they talk about this in how the writing helps them to navigate the world. Um, for some students talk about um, how the writing was therapeutic, um, how it was sometimes helped them bring clarity to their thinking. And they spoke about it being cathartic. Very often, this navigation of the world was not just emotional, it was also intellectual. In this example, the writer shares about how their experience of writing was cathartic. I think when I started writing the narrative, I felt really confused about where I was in my life and why I was making the choices that I was making. So writing through this, I don't know, um, lens of children, childhood reflections helped me understand my patterns at a time when I needed to, which was really cathartic. When they talk about navigating the world, um, it takes a variety of forms. Um, we saw here, it told, they talk about, you know, the healing, the therapeutic nature. Um, others talk about how it helps develop analytical skills and frames of mind. Um, some spoke about the human reasons for valuing writing. Um, a student spoke about how a piece of writing had been noticed by their boss and suddenly they feel very valued as part of that team. Others then talk about the social power of writing and the benefits that that can bring. So in summary, students speak to us about the value of writing, not just about, you know, across the spheres of writing, but also across the spheres of life itself. If we turn to the third characteristics, characteristic, which is, you know, it's strongly related to the feature of valuing writing, but students focus on the enjoyment or pleasure um, which they experience from engaging in personal expression and having an opportunity to be heard. This comes through in the examples shared here. In the first instance, the student speaks about the enjoyment of expressing their opinions. It's a way to get, you know, my thoughts and express my emotions and my feelings and my opinions on a certain subject. Um, when they talk about this pleasure and enjoyment, this is often associated with the opportunity to be creative which we see in this second example. The text has taught me to have fun with writing and to not take it so seriously all the time. It helped me realize why I like writing so much because I get to be creative. Um, and in the third example, we hear that this joy or this pleasure which the students express is related to being heard. I think knowing that it's not going to sit on my desktop or, you know, get graded and never looked at again, like I'm putting it out there for either a purpose. And really, I like that aspect of it. It's very pragmatic and it has the possibility to maybe improve someone's life or make some kind of change. The student again alluding here to kind of the power of writing for change. Next, we move on to the next feature of using writing for entry into and continuation of community membership. 14 of the interviewees spoke to this characteristic of writing. In the example shared here, the student shares the power of writing to establish, maintain, and assist connections and community building. Um, if we move along in the quotation, so I think for this recruiting for new members, I've done various like posters before for student government. So we're trying to, you know, recruit or I guess just kind of invite constituents to come to our meetings or come to our events, that kind of thing. So I think I guess it's satisfying because we're doing it not like just for ourselves, we're doing it for others as well. So I guess that's kind of something that's beneficial. When they speak about, 
you know, writing as part of the community and establishing community, they also talk about how writing can help a community, help a community to appeal, appeal to its audience, not just to establish and build that community. Next, we move on to um, the characteristic of perceiving writing as providing rich connections. In this instance, students speak to the richness of writing and its potential in forming connections in different ways. They talk about kind of contextual types of connections, relational connections, and potential connectedness. In the first instance, when they talk about the contextual um, connectedness or connections, they speak about the relationships between the spheres of writing, which we operationalize as recursivities in this research. What's interesting, though, is they do not talk about this connectiveness in a unidirectional way. They talk about it in a multidirectional fashion. So it's not just about how writing has influenced our other spheres, but it's about how those other spheres have also influenced their classroom writing, for example. This student from school one shares. So my personal opinion is that course and classroom kind of informs your interest in all other spheres. But you know, I think also other spheres like work or political might inform how you view something in the classroom. So in terms of content, I think that those things kind of do inform each other. Yeah. And I think, too, there's some shared aspects of writing and learning how to write and being critiqued on your writing in the classroom setting that do translate into other spheres and they make you a better political writer. They make you better at writing in your internships and they make you better at personal writing. So getting that feedback in my writing has been really helpful. Um, the students are motivated by these connections and by the connectiveness that they perceive between not just the spheres but the potential of writing to provide connections with people they talk about forming connections with the audience or with people through writing so these have important WAC implications for WAC which Ashley will return to in one moment and then finally the last sphere I suppose, not surprisingly, we ask students about the challenges that they face when they're writing. So not surprisingly, it is one of the characteristics. However, what's interesting about this characteristic is they're aware of the challenges inherent in writing. But what was very interesting to us was the way that they accepted these challenges and tried to build upon them. Um, in this first example, the student, student shares with us why they found it challenging. It's challenging because there's an audience who's seeing it. So there's always a little bit of that. What if people don't like it feeling? But I'm never afraid to post it. It's just, will this be successful? Or will my editor think that I'm a bad writer on the team and I should be reconsidered? This student is the only, not only is not the only person to talk about vulnerability. Other students talk about the vulnerability of making and sharing their writing with an audience. They talk about the emotional vulnerability. Indeed, students talk about the challenges inherent in the academic sphere. They talk about challenges that we're used to hearing about, things like time, the first time they write, dealing with the rhetorical context, etc. But what was interesting too was, is the way that they embrace these challenges um, and think about what they might do with them. As the student in this second example shares from school one, I think we always look at things from a certain way and we don't sometimes, it's hard to like open your eyes up and like see things from other people's perspective. But when you're writing a paper, you have to see things and approach things from different perspectives. Like I might write a paper one way, my professor might write it another way, and then I'll get feedback on how he took it versus how I was trying to convey it. And then you have to go back and edit your paper and like, oh, wow, oh, I understand what you're trying to say now. And then maybe it might even help you understand the prompt more. 
And I'll finish again there by saying that these insights have important WAC implications and Ashley will talk us through those implications now. Thank you, Ida. So now, Ashley. Thanks so much, Ida. Um, so um, just to kind of pull this together and connect it to WAC, I, I want to um, emphasize that the goals of of our research and the way we present the findings in the article that's coming out in the WAC journal was really to describe and document students' lifelike writing. So, um, you know, as it's revealed uh, in these diverse spheres of writing using students' own voices. Um, so you could see, and as Ida went through the six characteristics, we relied heavily on students' own words to describe these spheres. Um, you know, in the last session, um, in this room, we were talking about kind of expert knowledge and, um, you know, it was important to us that we not impose our uh, expert language on students and we gave them these kind of sphere framework, but then with some uh, opportunities for them to use other words to define it. And so we rely heavily on students voices here. And um, we see this kind of documenting the life wide writing characteristics, the six that we um, identified in our data set, as really a first step in um, helping us think about how we can bring this to WAC programs. Um, we, we haven't yet done that. And so it's an invitation to you all in the room, uh, a call that we make at the end of our article to take up uh, what we see as a really important uh, set of implications for WAC programs. But this is the first step is what are students saying? Where are they writing? What are they writing? And how can we think about uh, how that connects with WAC programs? So we'll leave you with these uh, four implications. So um, I think first and foremost, uh, you know, what came out of our data set was that students are already writers. And I think many of us in writing studies know this, but uh, as, as WAC leaders working with faculty across campus, sometimes faculty have assumptions that students aren't really doing any writing, um, but you could see in the quotes that Ida pulled for us that students identify as writers. And so knowing that we need to support faculty across the curriculum and creating opportunities for eliciting students' life-wide writing knowledge and experiences. Um, we found even through our research methods, the, the process of doing the discourse-based interview um, resulted in students drawing better connections across the spheres. So just that prompting and eliciting of, you know, where do you write, how do you write, what do you write, do you see any relationships between what we're doing in the class and what you're doing outside and, and kind of vice versa? Um, that was valuable for students. They had these kind of aha moments during our interviews. And so we see that there are, you know, WAC is a great place to invite faculty do, to do this kind of eliciting work. And some of the ways that we could do this uh, are through reflective writing, uh, the kind of visual mapping, again, in the composition form article, you can see the students maps that we had in the interview. I did that as an activity with students in class one day as just a way to start talking about writing. Where do you write? What do you write? And um, it was a great in class kind of activity also a research method. Um, uh, portfolios are a great way to, to elicit this in class writing or discussion, exploration of writing rituals. We weren't able to report on that piece of our data here, but um, students have kind of deeply embedded ritual roles around place, um, how they set the scene for writing. Um, and, and so there's some really interesting uh, pieces of our data around that as well. Um, as, a, as a second implication for WAC programs, we'd say, um, you know, this is an opportunity to use students' life-wide writing as a bridge for entry into and continuation of community membership, including disciplinary communities. So much of WAC and WED and WEC uh, is, is about helping students see themselves as not only writers, but perhaps forming new identities as disciplinary-based writers, um, identifying as an anthropologist or an art historian, art historian, um, and that writing, we know from 
naming what we know and threshold concepts and other uh, places that writing can be a way to develop that disciplinary identity. And so if we use this as a bridge, reminding students that they are already writers in, in different communities, they may not see themselves yet as a historian uh, and as a writer uh, uh, in that community, but we can use this as a bridge. It's something that is familiar to, to them and particularly our, let's see, is that the fourth uh, characteristic we identified was about using writing for entry into community membership. I mean, that came straight out of our data. Students were already seeing those connections. They just didn't always connect it to a disciplinary community. Um, that, as one final point about disciplinary communities, um, I want to, in our article, we reference a piece by Brian Hendrickson and Genevieve Garcia de Mueller about, you know, while we want to invite students to see themselves as part of disciplinary communities, uh, they argue that students need to be empowered to determine for themselves what it means to write across the disciplines. So really by initi initiating and eliciting um, students' relationships in their own communities with how they define for themselves what WAC and WID might be for them as a writer, I think this, this is a good model, this life-wide model for, um, for helping students build those bridges. Third, this is not an earth shattering finding. Uh, I think Jesse Moore said that this morning in, in the Elon presentation. You know, a lot of the, our, our implications here are just reinforcing what we know to be good practice, but we've got some new and different kinds of data to support those arguments. Um, so assign meaningful writing in diverse genres and for a range of purposes and audiences. Um, we know that uh, many of us as WAC leaders are encouraging faculty to do this, but again and again, we hear from students, as Alexis was saying about our survey data, where it was really stark, you know, the way in which students describe the writing in their courses in a very essayist um, way. Uh, and then they would, you know, just come to life in the interviews talking about all the other writing they do in other spheres. And so how can we bring that excitement, pleasure, enjoyment of writing uh, into the classroom? Um, and then, um, this finding also relates to uh, the recently published WAC at 50 collection, uh, edited collection that came out, particularly uh, we were interested in a chapter by Al Harahap, Frederico Navarro, and Alyssa Russell. Um, and, and this third implication we think really resonates with some of their arguments uh, related to what they call equity-based pedagogy that recognizes students' vernacular practices, makes room for student perspectives, and promotes mixed genres. So, so this is really an, a, a move towards um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, not only by embracing diversity of genres, but inviting students' personal experience and expertise uh, and knowledge making into how we are doing writing across the curriculum. Um, and the last one uh, kind of maps onto our sixth characteristic, which is, being transparent with students about the complexities and challenges inherent in writing and supporting them as learners through the process uh, in order to meet them. Um, as Ida was saying, uh, students know that writing is hard. <laughs> we don't have to tell them that. Uh, I think what was a little surprising to our team is that they, they seemed ready to, to take on that challenge. And I think uh, sometimes uh, as, a, as teachers, whether it's our community or other faculty communities across the disciplines, make assumptions about students, um, uh, uh, you know, taking shortcuts and things like that. Um, the data we were seeing, again, across three continents and six institutions represents, you know, that students really were ready to take on those challenges. They know it's hard, but they know they learn from it and grow from it. So being transparent with them about that when we assign difficult writing. Um, whether that's research essays or other, other diverse genres. And so this brings us to a place where we really invite you all in the room um, as researchers to, to help us continue this line of inquiry. The, you know, we've shared um, the student voices and the data we collected, um, but we haven't yet been able to um, study the impact of integrating these kind of life-wide practices in a WAC program. So um, we welcome your questions and comments about our research and how this might work in your own programs. And uh, we thank you so much for hanging in there here at the end of the day. Thank you. And we, we have time for um, questions, uh, comments, um, ideas. Oh, yes, thank you.
Yeah, I'm just curious if, you know, it's interesting that you came up with these different spheres and that most of the students, and part of your criteria was that they had to be, in order to be included, predominant in, in the responses from across all the students. Um, but did you see that some spheres, that there were differences um, among the spheres depending on students' disciplines, or did you track for that at all? I'm just curious. Um, I'll start off, but anyone on the team can jump in. Um, we did not track by discipline. Well, we did collect that, but there's a difference in the spheres and the characters. Yes, that's a good way to explain it. So, um, so the six plus other uh, seventh sphere um, was what we asked students about. Um, and so in our survey, um, in addition to collecting demographic data, we asked, you know, and we would have brief descriptions of each of these. Um, and they would identify, you know, check a box, do they write in that sphere or not? And if they do, it popped open an option for them to list what kinds of things do you write in that sphere and some other follow-up questions. So those were the spheres we asked them about. The six implication uh, characteristics of student writing that Ida talked us through, that is our analysis coming out of the interview data. So we looked across our 20, well, in this case, we focused on 21 interviews that we collected uh, and uh, let those themes kind of em emerge organically through our four-step process. Um, so in part, those were different things. I don't, does that answer your question though? No, she was going to be back disciplinarity and we really Thank did. you. So we didn't, in the surveys, we didn't ask them what discipline they were coming from, but in the interviews, we know who our interviewees are. And I think most of us did, we knew what their, at least their major and or minor were, and we, they were coming from different majors and minors. Um, we didn't look at that specifically, um, but you know, at you know, institutions, you know, they were coming from everything from humanities to social sciences to um to engineering to uh yeah to natural sciences so um we could look at that but we did not it would be an interesting um you know replicate pieces of the study with that in mind uh and maybe grab a little more and see um you know if that is something that English and English and writing majors, uh, but then like Ida, for instance, in Ireland, that like there aren't rec comp or writing majors at her institution, and so you know the data set there was a, a wholly d diverse set, not focused on writing, and so it was across. Um, and then like I used my WAC context. Uh, Yes, or in Oman. Right. Presence outside the United States, for that matter. So it's, uh, it's still evolving and may take shape. But overall, the data set that I know about the international context, they all came from the um, from different disciplines. Of course, we didn't look at uh, that. I think the other thing I'd say is that the, the N is too small with the interviews to draw any generalizations. I mean, so it might be interesting, you'd have you know one student in a technical major and another in a humanities major, and I mean, it would be interesting, but you couldn't make any generalizations. I'll, though I take your point. I mean, you could, you could replicate the survey and ask about majors and disciplines, and given the N there, which was over 200, then you could begin to maybe draw some distinctions. I will say that our impulse was exactly the reverse, however. Our impulse was really um, to try to see if students across the board internationally um, had 
writing lives? I mean, what, how much do they write? Because I think, I mean, to go, Ashley made this point before, that there's a common perception that students don't write very much. There's also, I mean, there's also survey data to suggest that students in high school and in college think that what they do in school um, is writing and they don't like it. And that what they do out of school is communication and they do like it. So one of the interesting things was that when we asked them what they wrote, they identified all this communication stuff or what has been you know, categorized as communication elsewhere. Um, so they understood. Um, now, to be fair, if these are the students who responded, they're a self-selected group, right? You can't claim that they're representative of, you know, writers everywhere. And some of you were nodding yeah. in the audience. You got there before we did. So we, I mean, we understand that. On the on the other hand, it was pretty interesting. I mean, it's not just it's not just. And I mean, and to Yogesh's point, um, you know, the context in Oman is really very different than the context at Allegheny. The context at Limerick is very different than the context at Georgia State. So the contexts are really different. And it was really interesting because the students didn't divide that way. I mean, they, you know, when Yogesh outlined the research, I mean, they really did have to meet that threshold. This was not going to be a report on what we see in U.S. students. This was not going to be a report on what we see in non-U.S. students. They all had to meet the same threshold, and they all did. And the other thing, I guess, to my mind that has been the most interesting, and then I'll, I'll connect it back to WAC for a second, and then I'll be back being quiet again, maybe, um, is how much students claim to be learning in the other spheres, you know, without direct instruction. They do all the things that we do when we learn anything that's new. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not complemented by direct instruction, maybe in a class later, but it does mean that they're learning a whole lot. And we just generally speaking, we being all of us in higher ed, it generally speaking, don't ask about that. And so the whole impulse behind lifewide writing is that we might do a different and a better job if we did. And if you agree with that proposition, then the question to me is, what do you ask? Because if you think of all of prior knowledge and people's experiences, there's a lot you can ask. And it can't be the case that by the time you're done asking, the term is over. <laughs> so you got to figure out what you're going to ask, when you're going to ask it, you know, and what you're going to do with it. Those are really important questions. And I think if we could get our heads around that, we'd have a very different educational enterprise. That's my manifesto 128. Thank you for listening. Oh, sorry. Other questions? Uh, I don't know. Can we see if there's things online? No, no questions online. Okay, I just yeah, I'm watching the chat here. There's oh, thank you, Ida. Thank yeah. you. Uh, to what extent were the students um, aware of an explicit of multimodality in the ways they were thinking about writing? Anybody want to take that? Yeah, I think. Oh, I mean, um, so I think. Um, they they were aware of that, particularly in our the map interview remap, which is our um, comp forum. So we asked them the map initially, and then we went through the, a series of, of interview questions where they had explicit artifacts that they were sharing. So here's something that I did, you know, in the um, in the co-curricular sphere, right? I did these social media posts, right, um, and then. Um, then we asked them to remap. Now that we've gone through, now where do you see those connections happening? And those were like, oh, right, because we took them through that and asked them explicit kinds of questions, back to Kathy's point, they started to see some of those, oh, wait, yeah, I do bring this into here and that into there. And oh, there are these connections that I hadn't thought about. So, you know, while some students, as, as I think Ashley mentioned earlier, decided not to make revisions to their maps, many of them did. Um, so, so yes, in the genres, the multimodality did come to light, I would say. Anybody else want to add? I would, I would also add that um, it, that's another place where sometimes in the interviews, we could see where students knew the language of multimodality. And you're like, oh, <laughs> even though, you know, we would assign S number, whatever, you're like, okay, that's, uh, you know, some students are more versed uh, often in US programs around the language of multimodality. And so that was also interesting to see students talk about uh, digital text or even non-digital text uh, and uh, using different kinds of language. So it, it would show up in various ways and we, we coded for that. 
um, in various ways, um, but sometimes it showed up in, in using different language across the full data set. And, and there was a disciplinary aspect to some of it. I, I remember very clearly there's a student from school one uh, who you know, sees spreadsheets as writing and, and wanted to know why spreadsheets weren't taught in his class. I think it's him, her, sorry, in her class. Um, and uh, uh, because, because she saw it as writing. So it came up in very, again, I mean, it was pretty natural, unforced context uh, because we weren't asking for that explicitly. They would raise those issues when they described their text. And, that, and we haven't emphasized that. And we haven't spent a lot of time talking about that aspect of the project. But before we interviewed the students, um, each of them sent a text from all the spheres that we were going to be talking about. And then our interview process went directly to that. So uh, that's also how a lot of that information was elicited. May I address an online question? Absolutely, um, go ahead. So we're being asked about whether the spheres emerged from the interview or from the survey data. So just to clarify that we predetermined the spheres. So as a research group, we looked at existing research. Um, we looked at research like Rosinski that we heard Paula's work that we heard this morning um, around the self-motivated sphere. And we use those to predetermine the options that we provided to students plus other in the survey data. And, and some of our students did come up with their own categories in the other. Hi, I have two little uh, methodology questions. One is how did you move from 240 survey responses to 24 interviews? Like what happened between there? And then uh, was there a selection process? And then also what was the seventh defining feature and why didn't it make the cut? So I, I can, I, yeah, so uh, I can, so we, our goal as a team um, was to try to get at least five interviews from each of the sites. Uh, we didn't quite get there, right? Again, pandemic. Um, well, there was, we did, we, so we tried to look, we, we tried to get a, a, a range. So those of us who had more than five, did kind of try to say, okay, let's try to look at some diversity, right? Whether that was, whether you were a first generation student, how many writing, um, demographic yeah, demographic data, data to try to, and, and so we, we sort of said, oh, it would be great if we could get these five students from our list. But again, you couldn't always get those five students because they'd scattered to the wind. So there was a little bit of finagling and trying to get some diversity, but, um, not not much. No, I mean, I mean, most of us were struggling to get our quota. Remember this because this is COVID, right? I mean, it's not it's not only that it might have been tricky to get your quota anyway, but it's COVID, and people have other things to do than help you with your research. Yeah, uh, even if you're offering them a twenty five dollar card, that just doesn't get it anymore, you know. <laughs> so. Right, yeah, so right. those were IRB constraints in certain contexts. So uh, where I was before, so I am right now in uh, Ohio. So, so, but uh, one of the sites was where I uh, con conducted the data collection, uh, Oman. And there the IRB said that, no, you can't play with money. <laughs> you can't pay money to anybody. Uh, so we were asked to do two to five at least. We could, some of us got three, some of us got five, some of us got four. So that's how we reached 24. Okay, so uh, the students were, uh, the participants were essentially supposed to give their consent beforehand that they are willing to be interviewed. So that's how from 239 to 24. Yeah, so happily we got some diversity, even sort of haphazardly. Uh, I can't remember the setup. We just talked to the side. <laughs> <laughs> so so first of all i just wanted to say thank you for privileging the student voices so much in the in the project that you did in the presentation that you had and just um for reminding us of the richness of the student writing lives that exist outside of the classroom and of course, disappointingly, about the flatness of the of the writing that that is that they associate with the with course based writing. Um, and I wonder, I, I I did wonder about that also about the the course based writing being so sort of flat and sort of 
it's the essay. There's nothing to be thought about. Um, and I went, and I wondered if they if if they actually are doing writing in their classes that is perhaps a little bit more inspiring and multi uh, genre. Um, but they simply reverted quite quickly to oh well, what I learn in classes is essays, and they're they don't have audiences, and they don't have. Um, so there, there's not they don't have real audiences. And so I just wondered about that. But thanks, thanks again very much, very much for privileging those student voices. So I'll just if, I'll just say quickly so that when, when the surveys said we got the essay right, but then when we actually did the interviews and we started to talk to students about the kinds of writing they were doing in their courses, they started to think more richly about them. So again, you know, I think it's sort of you know you think about. Well, what is a course based and their in, in initial ideas why write essays for professors, but then when you start to delve in and this is why we you know, encourage the kinds of right um, pedagogies that we're talking about is start to get students to think beyond that and they do start to see, um, I, I think. Would... So you mentioned the demographic data that you collected in the survey. I'm wondering, did you collect information about student age so that you could see if students so what did you notice about your non-traditional students? Was there anything interesting in that subset of their small subset? <laughs> Probably extra busy during COVID to have families. But I don't know that they were much worse. Yeah, so I think one of our Omani interviewees, right? Um, do you want to talk about who had written a, a book, right? First in the family uh, who, who, who was studying English and all that. So that way it was non traditional, you can say. But in terms of the gender neutrality and all that, if you're looking at, uh, I don't think anybody mentioned that. Well, about what? In, in our data set. From Oman, we, we, we don't have that concept. Okay, so that's not considered polite to ask about the third uh, categorization, you know. So those kinds of things also would be, uh, would have to be taken into consideration. Uh, so everybody just bifurcated themselves in that. We had the, uh, one, two out, one out of uh, two students that we had um, was the first in the family who's, who studied uh, English and who studied in the college. And uh, she wrote uh, books for spreading knowledge amongst her peers and uh, community, you know. So we, we had different kinds of responses. And uh, if you try to look at it that way, uh, those were quite uh, revolutionary ideas coming from a person who is first in the generation, in, in his or her generation to study something. <laughs> All, yeah. all the age groups, including 50 plus, um, I think I might have been a GSU student. Um, but uh, we, the interviews tended to cluster, and that may have been COVID. <laughs> I mean, our, the bulk of our interviews were like April and May 2020. So um, the bulk of those demographics were more traditionally aged. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good question. I will say, um, I mean, just drawing from the teaching for transfer research, we do have a lot of non traditional students in that data set. And um, I mean, overall, that's 100 plus students over the last 10 years. We have a piece coming out in C's. Um, and in, we look at, I think, nine students. and three of them are non-traditional uh, and they are very interesting in terms of again um, they're writing in different contexts and they're drawing in fact I mean one of them is a community college student who um, wants to be a nurse and she translates everything that happens in school um, in terms of her work as a CNA 
And the only reason she wants to stay in school is to get the RN. I mean, she, that's the goal. And everything is translated through that. So it's really interesting. It's really interesting because the reason she takes write, writing seriously is that she sees nurse notes influencing patient care. So, so that's just to say that there's definitely um, research on that and it's worth looking at. Yeah. And I'll just say from my work with student veterans who tend to be older than, you know, 18 to 22, that getting them to think about themselves as writing and the writing that, that what they did before they came to school was writing, you know, is a, is a switch. Um, but they, they also tend to see, interestingly, classroom writing as purposeful because it, they do see it as entry into a community that's not the community they're coming from. So, um, and also I would say Dana Driscoll and was another, um, they're her group from um, the WBU seminar. They're looking at um, folks at all stages of life and the kinds of writing that they do. So um, I would push you to their research as well. <laughs> other questions online, in person? But we'll unlock the doors now. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Ida, for staying up. Oh, thank you. Lovely to be with you. Thank you. You need a microphone. <laughs> I can't hear. We were saying bye, Ida. <laughs> oh, thank you for bye. Thanks for coming up. It was great. Bye, good Ida. To see Take you care. On. Um, chat soon. Yes. Good night, Ida. Yeah, thanks for staying care. up. All right. Yeah. Bye. Have a nice evening. Bye. 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 A weekend for heaven.